Hello, fellow risk takers, and welcome to my worst investment ever. Stories of loss to keep you winning. <laughs> in our community, we know that to win in investing, you must take risk, but to win big, you've got to reduce it. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm on a mission to help 1 million people reduce risk in their lives. To reduce risk in your life, go to myworstinvestmentever.com and today and take the risk reduction assessment I created from the lessons I've learned from all my guests. It's time to start building wealth the easy way by reducing risk. Fellow risk takers, this is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stotts from A. Stotts Academy, and I'm here with featured guest, Brenda Benz. Brenda, are you ready to join the mission? Absolutely in. Let's do this. Uh, I'm so excited to have you to the, uh, and, and on the show, and I just love your energy. And, you know, we were just, I was talking about something just before we turned on the recorder saying, I'm kind of losing hope in something. And you're like, I'm not. And I thought, okay, that, that's the spirit. I like that. So I know you're going to bring a lot of that onto the show. So let me introduce you to the audience. Brenda Benz is one of the world's top executive leadership coaches and motivational speakers. Recognized by both Thinkers50 and Global Gurus as an expert in her field, Brenda earned her MBA from Harvard Business School and is the author of 11 award-winning books on leadership coaching and branding. After a successful career managing mega brands for Fortune 100 companies, Brenda left the corporate world and has been successfully running her own business out of offices in both Singapore and the US, an experience that has given her ample opportunity to make plenty of mistakes. And I just wanna to mention to the audience that in 2021, she published her most recent books, The Forgotten Choice. And I love the title, Shift, your inner mindset, shape your outer world. Brenda, take a minute and tell us a bit about the value you bring to the world. Absolutely. Look, I look at leadership and inspired leadership and branding and how the two mix together. And I've put this into both what we do in the outside world, how we act, how we react, how we look, how we sound, how we build brands for ourselves. But that all starts from the inside world, how we think, what we believe, what we feel. And it impacts every aspect of our life. And when you can take those two, the how we think, feel, and believe, and mix it with how we act, react, look, and sound, you build an aligned life. And coming out of that from a career, professional, personal standpoint, financial standpoint, that's how you make the magic work. And how does someone know if they need this? Like, is it, are they just having a hard time and they feel depressed or they can't figure out what they want and they just, they're not able to kind of get that alignment. I mean, I'm curious, like for yeah. the listeners out there, if you're listening and let, let's hear what Brenda has to say about kind of how do we know what's the warning signs and how do we then take the first steps? Well, I jokingly with my clients called it the other F word feelings. <laughs> <laughs> we have to think about our feelings. The truth is we know if we're feeling aligned or not. Often what we do is we don't take enough time to recognize it, to take that moment to pause and say, something's feeling off here. I'm just not right. And when you feel that consistent lack of connection, you know that you're in a space where the inside and the outside just aren't fitting together. And so that's when you can look outside for someone to help you get back into alignment, to really, really achieve the life goals, the career, the finances that you want. You know, in my own personal story, I was ended up in, in drug rehab as a young kid. And I went through three different drug rehabs. But after that, I went through outpatient therapy and was attending 12 step meetings and all that and still do. And um, I added it up and I had had about 2000 hours of group therapy, individual therapy and family therapy. And you pretty much can't avoid, you know, going that deep into your feelings if you have good counselors who kind of push me. And Basically, I really learned to get in touch with my feelings and not be afraid of my feelings. I think I, in, I, I, was, I was terrified. I mean, part of the reason why I was using drugs and doing the things that I was doing is because I didn't feel good about myself. And I can just say that that journey at a young age just set me up. Like, I learned some lessons. Like, one of the lessons that I learned is that a feeling is like, it's a signal. It's a warning. You know, yes. stop stop and listen. That's the yes. first thing I learned. The second thing is that, you know, you can have it all. You know, if you, if you, if you try, if you try to feel your way through the day, feel how you feel, 
if you've said something wrong or you feel bad about what you've said, you can just go back and apologize. Yeah. And, you know, like there's so much that we can take off, the burden that we can take off ourselves that I think people don't yeah. either realize or they don't take the little steps that we, to get there. I'm just curious, like tell us just a, a little bit about how you help your clients and maybe some tidbits sure. for, for people who are struggling. Look, it all starts, the feelings actually come second. The feelings come after the thoughts and the beliefs. And what is a belief? A belief is just a thought that you think again and again and again and again until it becomes your natural, I know this to be the truth. But life is evolving so quickly, we have to pause and say, are those self-limiting beliefs? Are those beliefs really holding us back? Because honestly, most of the time they are. You know, we're programmed from the time we're just young by society, teachers, professors, and, and bosses and to think certain ways. And the world's changing so quickly. When we start to feel uncomfortable, we have to stop and say, aha, there's usually a number of beliefs underneath that are holding us back from greatness. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you've got to work, to work on the hard stuff. You got to look at that. And, and once you do, phew, the lid comes off. Is that what you do with clients? If somebody work with you that you would try to dig down to what are your underlying beliefs? Because if we can, mm -hmm. we can identify those and start to work on those. Yeah, well, we start there. We start there because that's, that's the source of everything, isn't it? Where we start is always with our thoughts and our beliefs and our feelings. That's, it's all under the radar. No one sees that. And then you can get into, okay, so how is that manifesting in the workplace? How is that turning you into the leader you wanna be or not be? How does this impact you in terms of wanting to be an inspiring leader? How is it impacting the brand you're building for yourself? And I, I work with a lot of very senior leaders, um, very you know, mm -hmm. most sweet folks, and they're impacting tens of thousands of stakeholders, often all around the world. So when you can start on the inside and you start to make changes on the outside as a result, they're not only powerful, they're sustainable. What's the best way for someone who appreciates what you're doing and likes that what's the best way for them to to connect with you oh just reach out at my website brendabents.com and uh, or brenda at brendabents.com email yeah feel free Great. to reach out fantastic Absolutely. take take up that opportunity ladies and gentlemen i think you you won't be disappointed <laughs> and i think you know the one thing i was thinking about is one of the things that i liked about having gone through all that kind of emotional journey at a young age or discovery let's say uh, and overcoming a lot of that is that um, it led to a life of more authenticity. And that's what this podcast is about. You know, it's uh, about coming on and talking about, you know, a, a truly, <clears throat> truly painful or difficult time and then how you dealt with it and what you learned from it. So I think it's time to share uh -huh. your worst investment ever. And <laughs> since no one goes into their worst investment thinking it will be, tell us a bit about the circumstance leading up to it and then tell us your story. Absolutely, Andrew. Well, listen, you know, I've listened to your podcast and I always enjoy the this, this sessions. And I know that you believe that 99.9% .9 of people are not fit to be entrepreneurs, okay? But so many people right now are leaving the corporate world and trying their hand at entrepreneurship. So I thought I would share my story of entrepreneurship and how it does relate to my worst investment ever. Mm. So the circumstances, um, just a bit of background. I, you mentioned that I work for Fortune 100 companies. I worked for big corporations, Fortune 100, across four continents. Uh, my last position was one of the top 300 of an 85,000 person company. I mean, I was pulling in a very, very nice six figure salary plus ample bonuses every single year, you know, flying around the corporate jet, had the title, the perks, the income. But then 9-11 uh, happened. So it takes us back a couple of, a few years, but still it's an important lesson that still lasts today. 9-11 happened in September of 2001. And on that day, Andrew, I was in Sao Paulo, Brazil for work. I was actually, I had just flown in the night before. It took me 40 hours to fly from Bangkok, where I was based at the time, to Sao Paulo, okay, 40 hours. And I was staying in the World Trade Center there. And I had just arrived the night before. And I saw that morning arrives, it's the morning of 9-11, it's the same time as New York, I'm seeing on television what's happening. And I, and I get a call from my boss within hours saying we're calling all top officers back to their home bases. So you need to fly back to Bangkok as soon as you can. Now, I suddenly realized in that moment that all the people that I loved were either in the United States, my family, where the borders were shut down, 
or they were halfway around the world where my husband was watching the news back in Bangkok and watching it unfold. And it just, it was one of those moments where it just hits you. And it was like, I am not living the life I wanted to live. Yes, I had the perks. I had the title. I had a lot of angst, <laughs> a lot of exhaustion. I was a harried executive. I wasn't spending enough time with my family, not good enough self-care, no me time. So I flew back to Bangkok within, well, I flew within three days. I flew 80 hours, okay, back to Bangkok. And I, back then you couldn't get on the plane with anything, like a purse or anything. They all, so I had nothing. And they said, I said, I need a piece of paper and a pencil. I sat down on the plane. I said, I need a piece of paper. She said, ma'am, I can give you a pen, but I cannot give you a paper. I'm like, okay, you have pens, but no paper. Okay, I could do more damage with a pen than paper, but okay. Um, and so she hands me a paper napkin and I wrote my business plan to start my own company on the way home. I didn't sleep at all. I was just going to do that. So when I got home, I announced to my poor husband, <laughs> I, cannot do I cannot do this anymore. I went to start my own company. Now you can imagine he was shocked. Um, and just for context, by the way, my husband had just started working for a VC backed company, brand new, like based in Bangkok. So our risk profile went from two steady incomes to me running a startup from scratch and my husband working for a high risk VC backed new company. I mean, can you imagine, right? But anyway, he finally agreed. He said, okay, if you got to do it, you got to do it. So I shared my decision with my boss and he asked if I could give them six months to find someone else to replace me. I did. So the following spring on April Fool's Day, 2002, I started my own business and I decided that would be the day that I would do it because if it didn't work out, I, it was April Fool's Day, right? I could just run back to, to the corporate world and say, kidding. <laughs> it's like being a worst podcast host. You know, we've always got an out. You start on April Fool's Day. You always got an out. So anyway, that's the context that leads up to it. So here we are, my worst investment. As you can imagine, Andrew, I did not want this to fail. Like there was tremendous risk involved already, as I just explained. And to exacerbate that, the previous three years in the market, 2000, 2001, 2002, there were three years of negative returns in the stock market. You may recall that. Minus 9%, minus 11%, minus 22%. So all this money I've worked hard to earn is being dwindled and dwindled and dwindled. And because we'd lost my income and my husband was in a VC company, we needed to make sure that we had enough that we wouldn't lose any more. So due to our situation, we've come, become very much more risk adverse, right? So I convinced my husband to get out of the market to make sure we safeguarded the funds that we needed to fund my new business. Now, mind you, <laughs> this was not an easy discussion to have, Andrew. We had a lot of arguments about that. My husband is a University of Chicago MBA. <laughs> He's a CFP, certified financial planner. I, but I was so scared and I could just see this money dwindling every single year and our portfolio was dropping year after year after year. So anyway, I, wanted, I just wanted to do anything I could to lose, lo avoid losing more money and having to go back to the corporate world. So. Just months after I started the business, we went largely into cash and sold over 90% of our equity investments. <laughs> now, Andrew, I don't know if you recall, but of course, in 2003, the market went up 28%. 2004, it went up over 10%. So <laughs> the market went back up, but we didn't get back into it for yet another three years. And we lost all those growth opportunities. So my worst investment was actually pulling out of an investment. <laughs> wow. And how would you summarize the lessons that you learned? Well, I think a couple of things. Number one, you have to think long-term, even in the face of heightened risk. And importantly, and this is what I write and talk about now, don't let emotions, primarily fear, impact your investment decisions. Because the link between your mindset and your money is direct. Right. And I had a fear, fear, very risk based mindset, and it was impacting our money situation, how I saw that. And the other thing I would say is sometimes you don't need a marriage counselor. You need a qualified investment advisor to reduce the stress in your life because we were bickering about how we were going to manage this. And so despite the fees, it was still definitely worth hiring an expert, especially, mm -hmm. today, especially today, by the way, when interest rates are almost zero. So cash is not yielding a return at all anyway. So mm -hmm. So anyway, good news in the end, the, I did make a great investment by starting my own business because this 
April, 2022, we will be celebrating 20 years of wow. success as a That's business. Exciting. And, and five years after I started the firm, it got so big. My husband joined me. So he quit his job and now we run the business together. We've been doing that for 15 years. Yeah. And that's, it's incredible. Yeah. That's, that's a great ending to the story. Um, there's a few things that, you know, I think about. One of the things as a, as a stock market guy all of my life, I've looked back. How many times have I looked back at a stock chart and saw that the market was down 30, 40, 50%? And I'm thinking, why didn't I pile in then? <laughs> and the reason why that it's, it's so hard to see is because there's no emotion attached to that price fall that when you look at it in, uh, in historical terms, but when you're actually going through it, there's a hell of a lot of emotion. And that emotion, you know, what's interesting about this case is that the emotion you were feeling was not really about the stock market. It was about the change you were facing in your life. And you really wanted to protect yourself in the face of that. Yeah the stock market falling just added to that. If the stock market was going up, you probably would have said, oh, let's just keep riding that, you know, but it's, exactly. it's, 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 you know, what people don't see. And it's the same thing. Uh, it's one of the hardest parts about investing is adding to your investment at the bottom of the market. And the reason why is because everything looks terrible. Yeah. And people are afraid I'm going to lose my job. I'm going to lose my cash flow. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm getting pressures. Maybe somebody, you know, my family is going to need to borrow money. And all of a sudden, mm -hmm you know, all of these pressures. And so it's a lot harder to do than it is to say, to stay invested in the market. Well, and on that time, don't forget, there was still a lot of fear in the world because of 9-11. And so, and it was all, it was dropping, dropping, dropping for three straight years in a row and not small. It was dropping double digits every single year. Mm -hmm. So it was one of those situations where I thought, no, all those years of all that hard work, I don't want to see all of my portfolio keep dropping and dropping and dropping. So anyway. So I'll, I'll tell you a story. Um, uh, about my that my mother told me and uh she she basically was telling me that when when they when my mom and dad retired in north carolina they had a pretty good pension and uh savings from dupont and dupont had given them options and abilities to to buy shares at low rates so they they took advantage of that so they ended up with a very large portion of their portfolio in dupont and my dad worked at dupont all of his life so they hired a uh you know, an advisor, and they started working with the advisor, and the advisor looked at it and says, you have to start reducing this position. And mm -hmm. they're like, no, my dad was saying, no way. Why would I reduce the position in DuPont? I know the company, and it's, you know, he said, look, you know, the stock price was, I don't know what it was, let's say it was 100. You know, mm -hmm. what if it went down to 20? What would the, be the impact on your family's future and all that? And my dad was like, it's not going to go down at 20. <laughs> but anyways, okay, we'll listen to you. And the, 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 the advisor started like trimming that position year by year. And what my mom told me is that it went down to 20. And, but by that time they were already out, you know, and much more diversified. And so, you know, it just shows that there is a value of a third party kind of coming in with a bigger perspective and, yeah. You know, that's a critical thing. And I know I, I do a, a portfolio strategy that I have with a, a firm here called Phenomena in Thailand. And we've got a lot of people that are following that strategy. And I, I meet with them every month. And a lot of what I try to do is show them, show them the structure I'm using for what I'm doing and the long-term perspective that I have and try to give them comfort that, you know, okay, don't put everything in this. Yeah. But what you put in, you've got to think 10 years, 20 years, mm -hmm. not, you know, six yeah. months, three months. So I think well, you brought yeah, out a lot of lessons. Like, you know, what else is interesting. A lot of executives get stuck into this, too, because they have so stock laden with their existing company. And that's how their company, you know, remunerates them, right, with bonuses and you get extra stock and all this. You start realizing that your, your portfolio is completely out of whack. It's completely out of balance. And one of the things I'm proud of right now is we really do have a well-diversified portfolio now across many asset classes. So, mm. but again, I'm married to a, you know, MBA with finance and whatever. <laughs> yes, what's, gotta what's, be diversified. I'm, I'm step away from the, step away from the gun, right? I am, I've stepped away from pulling out of the market. <laughs> so I think, you know, I'm really interested to hear your answer to my next question because not only have you been through this situation, but also having written the books, The Forgotten Choice, as well as your other books, you know, and, and doing what you do, you, you have a different perspective. And so here it comes. 
based upon what you learned from this story and what you continue to learn, what one action would you recommend our listeners take to avoid suffering the same fate? Yeah, you know, I guess my answer would be watch your thoughts. Watch how you're thinking about things because we have self-limiting beliefs that are driving just about everything. Well, I would say pretty much everything in our life. And until we can surface those and look at them and say, aha, that's what's going on. I see, I see. Until we can challenge those beliefs, we're always going to do the same thing over and over and over and over again. And when you can stop long enough to look at them like an anthropologist almost on the outside looking down, like you're on the top of the mountain looking down objectively, you'll suddenly see it and you go, oh, yeah, maybe that's not true. Maybe I could look at that differently. Yeah. Mm. Observe yourself. Yeah. Be so the observer, what, uh, uh, an examined life. Yes. Yeah, that's beautiful. And uh, one thing I thought about when you were telling your story was, I think it was William James that said that the conclusion that he had come to was that we, uh, it w used to be thought that we, when a, when a bear comes chasing after us, we feel fear and then we run. But he said, in fact, we run and then we feel fear as in the action, action leads to emotion. And mm -hmm. that was, you know, made me think a lot, but anyways, mm -hmm. now let me ask you, what's a resource that you'd recommend for our listeners? Sure. Well, you know, if, if they're interested in thinking about mindset, I have a free resource. If you just come to my website, brendabents.com, right on the homepage, you can sign up for my newsletter and, to, and you'll get an, a free seven point set, uh, program for how to manage your mental well-being, your, your mindset, to build an inspired mindset, because I think the inspired mindset is what really helps us drive where we want to go. That's exciting and that's valuable. I mean, I, particularly when there's so many pressures on us these days mm -hmm. and you yeah. know, we're home alone and uh, you know, mm -hmm. pressures everywhere and fear, yeah. fear everywhere. Oh, it's everywhere, Andrew, <laughs> but it doesn't have to be that way. And that's what this mindset toolbox helps you with. That, really get to the point where you have another choice beyond fear. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's, that's uh, valuable. So ladies and gentlemen, I'll have that also in the show notes. So just go to the show notes, click on it and get access. Last question. What is your number one goal for the next 12 months? Yeah, well, I'm working on building uh, more passive income, more passive income. Um, I, the nature of our business is if I'm not speaking or I'm not coaching, we don't make money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, I mean, that's a bit exaggerated. It's not that black and white anymore, but it used to be like that. So I'm really working on building more passive income as a part of the business. Uh, around some new online coursework I'm preparing, some, you know, obviously in my books, et cetera. But also I just signed up to be a presenter on an app, with 5 million subscribers, and I get paid every time that someone listens to my track. So, you know, there's those kinds of passive incomes that are nice to have where you're adding value at the same time and you bring in that passive income. I have no doubt you're going to you're going to succeed in that because you've got a lot of great content and really it's just bringing that content to platforms that have audiences as an example and you know figuring out other ways so i'm looking forward to hearing more about that in 12 months <laughs> all right all right well, thank you yep listeners there you have it another story of loss to keep you winning if you haven't yet taken the risk reduction assessment i challenge you to go to myworstinvestmentever.com right now and start building wealth the easy way by reducing risk as we conclude, Brenda, I want to thank you again for joining our mission. And on behalf of Ace Dots Academy, I hereby award you alumni status for turning your worst investment ever into your best teaching moment. Do you have any parting words for the audience? Enjoy, have fun, and let go of fear. Woohoo! That's a wrap on another great story to help us create, grow, and protect our wealth. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, this podcast is about one guest, one story, one mission to help one million people reduce risk in their lives. Fellow risk takers, this is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stott, saying, I'll see you on the upside.